Good afternoon. My name is Murat Sönmez, a member of the Managing Board of the World Economic Forum. A warm welcome to all of you and to all of you who are watching this uh, webcast uh, session on Powering Africa. Uh, Powering Africa is part of our ongoing um, effort as the World Economic Forum on energy, electricity, oil and gas. And the insights that we generate from this session will be carried into the work and will be published on our online platform, TopLink and Transformation Maps. Electricity, which is the topic of today's session, is vital. It's a lifeline for economies. And when there is power, there is development. And at the World Economic Forum, we focus on increased access to energy, improving its affordability and security, and actively pursuing environmental sustainability. And trade-offs have to be made, and, but they're all essential ingredients. Without further ado, I'll hand the uh, session over to Trevor, who will be guiding us through this session. Trevor, the floor thank is yours. You, thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. We're still waiting for uh, two um, speakers to join us. But in the interim, we will get the show going. Essentially, the idea is that we have a conversation uh, around uh, the middle where we are, and uh, we involve everybody else. Let me start, for, for, first of all, by introducing to my right um, Innocent Dutiro, who is a partner and head of uh, South Africa Financial Services Practice at uh, Bain and, uh, and Company. And then move on to my uh, left, um, Linda Mabena Olugunju, who is Managing Director, DLO Energy Resources um, in South Africa. And um, lastly, uh, but, but certainly not least, uh, Babs Omotoa, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer um, at uh, LNG in uh, Nigeria. The way we want to frame it, I think, uh, let's see how it's, it, it, the conversation is going to evolve, is to say this is a crisis that's a huge opportunity for the African continent. How do we turn the crisis um, into, into an opportunity. There's over 600 million Africans at the moment who are without electricity. That's a huge challenge. Um, they don't have uh, means of uh, cooking with clean energy and that kind of stuff. Another very frightening statistic is that the entire sub-Saharan Africa uses electricity far less than that that is used by Spain. That's shocking, isn't it? Um, and that at current trends is going to take us, I think, until 2080 for the majority of Africans to have access to, uh, to power. And another negative is that uh, the absence of uh, uh, power, the blockages, uh, the shortages, results in about 2 to 4 uh, percent GDP slowdown. That's how much it costs us. That Africa needs 55 billion US dollars a year from now until 2030 for us to be able to catch up. But the good thing is that not all that money needs to come from outside the continent. So we're going to be looking at what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what are the financing, uh, what is it that cannot be done. Let me start, if I may, with uh, you, Innocent, to sort of give us um, a rundown of what it looks like, of what the key challenges are, or what the opportunities are in, in about two minutes. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Trevor mentioned, uh, I'm from Bain & Company in a financial services practice, but uh, I have a history in the power industry. My uh, first ever uh, job was as a power station engineer, so I've spent time in nuclear, coal-fired, uh, and hydroelectric plants. So I know a little bit about the industry. Africa, as Trevor said, needs sufficient, sustainable, and affordable power to, to fuel its development. Uh, growth and job creation is heavily dependent on us being able to power our economies. Our desire and quest to industrialize cannot happen if we don't have uh, sufficient power. And socioeconomic benefits like improved living conditions will flow from that. So this is really a critical cornerstone and enabler of all the conversations that we're having about developing the continent, moving us to a different and a new paradigm in terms of uh, economic development. 
Trevor mentioned the statistic which uh, African Development Bank has uh, put out there that says if we address our power problems, we will have an extra 2% uh, on our growth, on our GDP growth. That's, that's quite key. And, and there are key considerations for each country. Uh, remember, this is historically been a, com a country competence. So for each country, uh, the, the key considerations, which are the quantity of supply that you need as a country for your own economic aspirations, the security of supply. Are you going to be relying on a supply source that you control and you're confident in its security? They also, the energy mix over time, which uh, the issue of uh, climate, climate change and emissions has, bring, has brought to the fore. If you look at, um, if you use South, Africa, use South Africa as a proxy, 94% of our energy is from coal. And, and with probably another 4% uh, or 5% from nuclear, uh, renewables are growing, but still minuscule. And that is a function of um, the kind of primary energy sources that we have in this part of the world. In the, in, in the SADC area, coal is the primary supply, uh, source of our primary energy. There's a bit of hydro, but not, uh, not that much. Uh, and traditional sources, the, the key thing that we also need to understand is that electricity supply falls into two categories. There's the base load, which basically is defined as the load that powers the minimum load that is required by a country. And then there's the picking load. Traditionally, uh, coal and hydro and nuclear have been your, because of the efficiency that, that comes from it, the scale, etc., have provided base loads. So one needs to have that at the back of your mind when you look at solutions and how you want to solve the, uh, the challenges that we have. And, and there are a number of factors that are detracting from uh, sustainable solutions. And, and I think I'll pause here and we will continue the discussion. Right. Can I invite you to, uh, in the first instance, just introductory uh, remarks and then we get into, into, into the meat. What, what, how do you perceive issues, uh, particularly within your area, community-based solutions um, as far as power is concerned, the supply side and the demand side? Um, okay, my name is uh, Linda, and I'm an um, IPP developer in the renewable space, so my bias is obviously towards renewables. Um, as was mentioned, I think the power issue varies across the continent, country to country. I think South Africa recently has done very well in its IPP program, in particular with renewables. As was mentioned, you do need a diversity of supply, um, a mixture of your base load and peaking, and a mixture of technologies as well. However, the advantage of renewables, um, I would say, is the quick construction time and how quickly you can get renewables onto the grid and the fact that they are clean energy. So to give an example, uh, from, since the inception of the Renewable Energy IPP program, ESCOM has um, connected 36 projects, which has amounted to 2,030 megawatts of electricity being put on the grid in under three years. So it doesn't solve our base load uh, issues, as was mentioned. However, it, it goes a long way in uh, reducing um, demand and meeting some of the energy needs. What I think is required across the continent, really, is regulatory framework that is clear for investors to put money in, whether it be coal, nuclear, oil, I mean, gas to power, etc. You. What, what took so long for the South African program to take off was the clarity in the legal regulatory framework. And why we haven't had a large-scale IPP program similar to the South African model across the continent is, again, um, that lack of clarity and also a commitment from government to underwrite these power purchase agreements so that investors feel comfortable putting their money into these projects. What, what's the state of play as far as the regulatory uh, situation is concerned all across the continent, not just in South Africa? Okay. Are we in a happy place? It varies from country to country. Right. So an example, um, I've done some projects in Namibia, and one of the issues we had getting projects off the ground there was because the Bank of Namibia wouldn't um, underwrite um, power purchase agreements. And also, there wasn't a, an, an overall renewable IPP or an IPP program. So you almost need that drive from government to say, we want to do a large scale uh, uh, program. So you do have. Um, projects popping up in different countries. So for example, I know in Ghana, there's a, there's a large scale um, a solar uh, plant that's meant to have gone up 200 odd megawatts. But again, there's nothing at a national level. So what's required if you're going to address these issues is a national policy on energy similar to what has been done in South Africa, if that can be replicated. That's one point. Just a quick one on the, um, what are the concerns as far as uh, 
the, the governments are concerned in terms of uh, the, 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 the legal framework to buy back the power and that kind of stuff? Well, the issue is always a risk. Where does the risk lie? Yeah. How do you allocate risk? That's what we always fight over when we're negotiating uh, PPAs. Um, and you need to allocate risk, and risk needs to sit where, you know, with the party who can, who can handle it. Um, the South African PPA is not a 100% perfect. Right. However, it's the closest thing we, we've had, you know, and it is bankable. The banks will support. And I think what's important is governments involving the private sector when they are drafting this policy. So what they did right here is that National Treasury involved the major banks, involved uh, investors, and we got that PPA uh, relatively correct, and it's always changing. I mean, the things that are changing to the program, it's not stagnant. And now that program for renewables is being replicated for the coal program and for the gas utilization uh, master plan that's going to come out as well. Fantastic. At this juncture, let me um, welcome and introduce uh, Mr. Ngubane, who is uh, the interim uh, chairman of XCOM. Thank you, sir, for, for joining us. And also to welcome Elizabeth Littlefield. Thank you. We're delighted to have you on board with us. Um, Omato, you are in the gas sector. What are the constraints? What are the opportunities? Do you see this being a solution for the continent? Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. <clears throat> when I look at the situation of power in Africa, which I think you described as a crisis, what always comes to my mind is when I remember the uh, thousands of, of Africans who have been found in recent times to be moving on boats from North Africa to Europe, Italy, and hundreds if not thousands dying in those uh, endeavors. And when you look at it, while some of those may have been from uh, political or security challenges, I think a lot of it is economic uh, driven. And the power situation in Africa, just 68 gigabytes in sub-Saharan Africa, I think is a huge contributor to the level of poverty and desperation you see in Africa. So I think it's, a, it's indeed a huge crisis, uh, which I think uh, requires, in my view, uh, an emergency action by, by leaders in, in Africa. Uh, coming specifically to the solutions, of course, a diversity of, of options. Gas, I think, has remained one of the biggest uh, part of the equation, uh, like all other hydrocarbons, coal and, and, and oil. But gas has the advantage of being the cleanest uh, hydrocarbon. It's also cheaper, more available, and has been a big solution. What we've seen in Africa in the last few years is quite a, a huge uh, variations in developments that have occurred. Uh, in the conventional space of gas, we've seen new countries like Mozambique and Tanzania, who never featured on the gas uh, uh, equation, become the biggest gas uh, reserve countries in, in Africa. Uh, and that, what that tells you is that we just haven't even explored enough in Africa, especially on the east and west coast of Africa, huge gas opportunities that we haven't touched. And when you think about the unconventionals, I think you know South Africa has been one of the biggest areas of opportunity in Cairo, Mauritius, Nigeria, opportunities in, in gas. So I think when you think of gas, Africa really has not explored the potential that I think we have quite a lot of. Why? Why have we not? Uh pursued the potential? It's a combination of, uh, of factors. I think uh, in many of the countries in Africa, of course, oil and gas is quite heavy in terms of investments and technology. It requires very good uh, a fiscal and regulatory framework. Uh, it requires infrastructures to be in place. And when you think about the number of Africa, in fact, Mozambique and Tanzania are only just about developing uh, their first set of real regulations around, uh, around this uh, area. Nigeria, uh, another country with uh, oil and gas, just about maturing the, the level of uh, regulation fiscal. So I think regulation infrastructures have been key issues. Of course, financing, because these are hugely expensive projects uh, to run. Uh, but finally, just to add that apart from even what we know today, there are new technologies also emerging. A few years ago, most people didn't know about shale gas, which today has changed the whole world. But we also know that uh, there are new technologies coming through called methane hydrates, which uh, Japan has started to already pilot, which can even have five times more what we see in shale and, and uh, conventional gas. So huge opportunities. And I think projection is that by 2040, 
uh, close to half of the power solutions for Africa will still have to come from uh, base loads like gas. Uh, and I think that's where we need to pay attention to. Okay, Mr. Nguwane, you've been in the news, um, ex excom in terms of power supply and the constraints and uh, uh, how how long are we going to be in this space, you know, of, of load shedding? Um, uh, how long will it take us to get out of this and, and, and plan properly so that uh, we don't have the kind of negative effect yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, load shedding is having on the economy, on uh, job creation and, and things of that nature? Well, it's a very complex area. You know, it need, it means sufficient money. It means means sufficient uh, technical skills being available all the time. We have a number of old power stations reaching the end of life. Most of them will have to be retrofitted with the flue gas desulfurization to meet the current emission standards. But of course, it's been 20 years since South Africa built a, a new power station. So it's a fairly complex area, but I can probably ask you whether we've experienced any load shedding since you arrived in the country. <laughs> so, and the answer would be no, mm -hmm. because we are dealing with the issues. We are minimizing load shedding through the use of the 800 megawatts being brought in by the 60 unit at Medupi. Next year, we are hoping to finish the, the Ingula, you know, pump storage, which would give us probably about 3,000 megawatts. ESCOM has been uh, fixing and maintaining some of their units. They have now come back online, and this is why we have not seen load shedding. And we, as we we're move, grateful for that. Yeah, <laughs> as we move along this trajectory, we hope to make load shedding mm. just a nightmare, right. a thing of the past. We have a very clear governance structure coming in into ESCOM. You know, contracting with all the management, right from the CE, right down to the manager at the power station. Liquidity has got to be maintained by every cost center. Governance has to be very clear in terms of performance contracting and evaluation, and of, which is operational excellence and financial management in terms of liquidity. So uh, the stage is being set for effective governance. So I am hoping that my wish that by the end of this year we see the end of load shedding will come true. Mm. And from the way the steps we are taking, we are getting there. Our CEO goes to, with his senior executives, to power stations every Friday. You know, that is now a standing routine to check, to track, to monitor, and to report back to the board. Fantastic. In terms of your toolbox, um, Nuclear is featuring. Um, what what other options do you have? Okay. Um, and and also, the the the, the next phase of uh, the build up of infrastructure. What does that look like? So that your toolbox and then the yeah. the, the build up of infrastructure moving forward. Well, the, the two major infrastructure projects we have, or the three rather, it's Ingula pump storage, the two coal fired power stations Gusile and Medupi. Those are the new build. You know, the allocation of license, licenses for the independent power producers lies with the Department of Energy. But they've also been very proactive in calling for bids. We are now in the fourth window of bidding for solar, wind. The minister has called in requests for information from industry in terms of gas use. In other words, we'll first convert some of the power stations we have into gas but we'll also build new gas uh, electricity generation in the country. So that's going to be a very big project. The re results are still going to come in so we can see what shape it's going to take. Nuclear will only be about 9,500 megawatts. So it's not as big as people tend to project in the newspapers. It's just part of the mix. Right. We are moving more towards renewables because in the long run, renewables would be cheaper than coal, you know, and, and, and so, but of course in all this we, we need leadership from the regulator. The regulator decides what pass-through monies come through us. 
you know, and, and that's what determines the pace and the rate of development. But of course, I must add that we are part of the great Grand Inga negotiations. 2,500 megawatts will pass from Grand Inga to South Africa. We are talking with Zimbabwe and uh, Zambia about how we will share that pass through from Inga with them. So the Southern African power pool is also going to be very intimately involved as far as Inga development is concerned. And this will be just the first take mm. on the Inga project. Obviously, it's going to grow much, much bigger. Fantastic. I'd want to set some point to get to how we look at the regional cooperation to make energy uh, a thing of the past. Elizabeth, allow me to move over to you and welcome. Thank you. Um, the, the, clearly, one of the problems that we keeps coming up, apart from the regulatory uh, framework, apart from the pricing issue, is the appetite for investing uh, in these huge projects. Before you came in, I was talking about uh, Africa needing 55 billion a year until mm -hmm. 2030 to close the gap. That's a huge gap. What's, what's, what's the view within the investor community as far as investing in, 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 in infrastructure uh, and all the issues related to uh, making that investment uh, pay within a reasonable time? Oh, thank you very much for that question, but maybe I could start by just saying what, what um what my organization has been doing in the power sector, and then I maybe can come to the challenges, and I'd love to talk about the regional sure. cooperation as well. So for those of you that, that are not familiar, um, I work at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is uh, the US government's development finance institution. And um, we're, we're, our job is to help stimulate private capital flows into sustainable economic development um, in emerging markets. Um, and we do that by providing long-term uh, financing uh, loans, uh, as well as political risk insurance and other things that mitigate the risks and provide stimulus for that capital to, to flow. Um, actually, we've made Africa a, a priority for ourselves, and we're very proud to say that uh, as uh, evidence of the kind of investor demand that, that you mentioned, uh, that we've seen our portfolio in Africa grow from about six, seven, eight percent of our $10 billion portfolio to um, a full quarter, and by the end of this year, it should be a third of our portfolio, which I think is indi indicative of how much investor demand we see, because, of course, our long-term loans are accompanying somebody, some private investor's uh, capital. Um, so it's been a priority for us, and we're really proud to have seen how, how big it's become. And the, on the renewable energy front as well, uh, we've made renewable resources a, a priority since I joined um, the agency in 2010. Uh, it's grown tenfold, uh, renewable energy across the globe. So now we're doing um, a little over a billion dollars a year in financing of renewables. And on the continent here, you know, that ranges from everything from geothermal, where we've funded the Olkaria project in Kenya, doubling its capacity, uh, to wind, where we're working not only on, in, uh, in Kenya on some of the very large wind projects there, but also uh, in, in West Africa, where we're working on some wind projects there. Solar, uh, we just, I was just yesterday at uh, Boshoff visiting the Sun Edison facility uh, near Kimberley, um, but also off-grid. Uh, we're doing quite a lot in off-grid as well as mini-grid solar because we know that's the way much of the rural population is going to get its, its power. And then I should mention gas because you mentioned it earlier. Um, a good portion of our portfolio is now uh, in the gas sector, and we're proud to be participating in the Azora um, IPP in Nigeria, but and looking at a number of other natural gas deals across the continent because we too agree that base load uh, power is going to be necessary. You know, that being said, what's what gets me excited is when you look at Africa really being all in a lead position in terms of renewable energy build out uh, throughout the world. You know, maybe coming from a low base, but in 2014, Africa added more renewable energy than in the previous 14 years which is a rate that no other, no other continent can, can claim. So we're, we're excited about that. With respect to the challenges, though, um, I see a, a few that, that investors uh, bring to us and that we see in trying to execute uh, these transactions throughout the continent. Um, first, there was an interesting survey that was done recently about what investors see as the number one hindrance. And actually, regulatory frameworks was the lowest of their concerns. But the highest con uh, concern cited by investors in these surveys was political will, execution capability, and a sense of urgency on the part of the, the ministries. And, um, and we see that as well. Um, and so uh, actually Power Africa, um, I think, is addressing this in some small part 
but uh, we, we definitely see this as a problem as well. Now, it's true that there's some countries that have a bad recollection of some unfair transactions that were poorly structured that left a bad taste in their mouth. But we do see that execution capability as being a number one hindrance. Um, the second capability of the hindrance, of course, as much of, 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 as, of we've discussed often, is the creditworthiness of the off-takers. Um, you know, it's interesting, just 10 or so years ago, you all would know better than I, you know, two-thirds of the power being financed on the continent was for export. Um, and that made it much easier to finance, whereas now it's two-thirds for domestic consumption, and that makes it more complicated because you're relying on the creditworthiness of the, of the off-taker. And I think you mentioned earlier, you know, how do you share risk uh, between the off-taker um, and the developer and the financier? And that's, that's talk, been a talk challenge. Talk to me about the, the political wheel. I mean, why would, they, oh, why the would that be a problem when, you know, it looks like this is a crisis and the politician would want this issue to be resolved? I, I think what we're seeing is that ministries don't often have a deep enough bench within the ministry to, to, to undertake a complex uh, new structured, you know, structured financing transaction. Um, that's, that's what we've seen in country after country. And, you know, President Obama's uh, announced the um, Power Africa initiative just, just a year and a half, almost two years ago now. Um, and one of the dimensions of that, which has been very, very useful, has been uh, the coordination of transaction-specific technical inputs at the ministry level and the transaction advisors mm -hmm. housed in ministries throughout the continent that we've seen, at least, have had a material effect on speeding along um, the process of transactions, as well as bringing f financial resources to bear to provide, for example, um, international legal counsel to, to, uh, to governments throughout the mm -hmm. continent. Fantastic. But can I mention just the third sure. challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned execution capability. I mentioned the credit worthiness of the off-taker. The third one, frankly, is the persistence of fossil fuel subsidies, something I think we don't talk about enough. But that market, the, the market distortions. Sorry, is that no, me? It's no. uh, Mr. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry. Um, I do think that the persistence of fossil fuel subsidies creates such market uh, poor signaling for the market that it's actually a real hindrance to the development of renewable energy across the continent. So I, I fervently hope that with fossil fuel prices being where they are today, it's a great opportunity to move ahead with addressing the, the persistence of fossil fuel subsidies. Fantastic. At this particular moment, I would want to um, ask to entertain a couple of questions from uh, people in the room. Uh, if anybody has a, a, a question or a contribution right now, this would be the right moment to do that. Yes, uh, introduce yourself and then briefly uh, ask your question. Thank you very much. I'm Kalle Stadtwein, the Minister of Finance of Namibia. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, if I'm allowed, two or three comments and then one, one question. Sure. Shall we make them two? And, and, um, a question and a comment so that we give everybody an opportunity. A question and a comment. Okay, can I, can I ask the question at the end? Because it goes back with my. <laughs> it's all right, Minister. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think what was quite correctly mentioned is the, the um, question of how we can make financing of these very necessary infrastructure projects um, feasible. And I think there was some reflection of what was the hindrance and was called political will. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me share with you what our problem in Namibia was uh, when we tried to negotiate uh, power purchase agreements. The financiers insisted on a guarantee of price, not production cost. They insisted on no taxes at all and a complete policy freeze. And that was the basic framework that um, the government was confronted with to say, if, if we don't give that, if you don't guarantee that, we cannot finance, the risk is too high. We consulted with the World Bank and we found that that is not according to international best practices. That is too greedy, if I may say so. Because if you have a sovereign guarantee, which Namibia has, you don't need to guarantee this. The guarantee for cost, production cost, is a reasonable one. So th there must be a toning down of ambition on the side of the of the financiers if we want to have these agreements 
um, sure. clinched. Mm -hmm. There is no lack on political will on the side of the necessity of to have them and the necessity to have an, uh, a good mix okay. of sources of energy. So those are the comments. My, my, my question is, we are talking about costs of infrastructure, we are talking about um, the necessity to have electricity, and we benchmark everything against that cost. What we feel is left out of the equation is the tariff policy and the affordability of that power. If I see what happens in South Africa and Namibia, we have got extremely steep increases in tariffs. We have that in spite of a very skew economy where the majority is relatively um, poor. And we do that while we are trying to industrialize and be competitive with our finished goods that we so produce, of which power is an important input. Now the question is, is tariff not an important consideration? Shouldn't we do a focus on that as well? Tariffs. Tariffs. Okay. Cost of, and then lastly, our model is we, we produce power through utilities. Mm -hmm. Like ESCOM, like NumPower, and we have not yet um, managed, in, in my opinion, enough to leverage private sector appetite to venture into the sector. Okay. Right. Wouldn't that be a possibility that we should? Right. Um, panelists, not those questions. Um, uh, any other question? Can I please ask if you're going to ask, if you'll be brief, no questions? All right, shall we deal with that? Uh, who's going to respond? Who fill? You fill? Yes? I'd like to respond. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go through um, your three points that you raised. The change in law, the issue there for investors is when there's a change of law that will affect the returns of a project adversely, it makes it difficult to invest in that project because you're loaning money uh, to finance these projects, um, first of all. The other issue there was um, some of the loans were being done in dollar denomination, and I think there was an issue with, um, with the currency risk as well. The second point in terms of your tariffs, if you look at the South African model in terms of renewables, it, what we did right here was the competitive bidding. We didn't uh, do a traditional feed-in tariff. So if you look at the SAWIA, which is the South African Wind Association study today, it's, uh, wind power has come in 40% cheaper than new coal build. So renewables are bringing tariffs down. It's cheaper electricity that we're putting on the grid. And I think it's a model that can be followed. Thirdly, um, in, I, I think your point was about um, uh, utilities. Again, it goes back to encouraging investment. We, people want to come into Namibia. Um, you know, we, we, we definitely want to play at the rest of the continent. I think if we just start having a generally, um, not greedy, just um, a stable uh, sort of uh, environment for investors, there's really no need um, why we wouldn't come in. Uh, so, yeah, I'd definitely like to chat to you afterwards. <laughs> Look, yes, please. So, if, if I may just add one, one small comment, and I apologize for having my back to you, but that's the nature of the beast in this room, I think. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I would fully agree with what you said. We're seeing um, in, in just uh, one set of solar investments the, the, uh, the price of the power having dropped in the last two years from 30 cents now down to 7 cents, and that's clearly competitive with most of the baseload yet uh, thermal power that's being produced. But with respect to the, the power purchase agreements, we too found that a lot of time was being lost between the, the, the governments and the developers and the financiers negotiating and losing time on basic, on basic terms. So we developed actually um, with our fellow development finance institutions and US government agencies a consensus document on one piece of paper uh, that has the 10 elements of a bankable power purchase agreement. Mm. So we thought that would be helpful guidance and less is more. So just 10 pieces of paper, 10 elements on one piece of paper that just talk about the basic elements that most financial institutions, development institutions or banks are going to want to see in a power purchase agreement to be able to finance it. If anybody would like a copy of that one page document, you are mm. welcome to send me an email at elittlefield100 mm. oh, e at opic.gov. Mm. 
and I, I'm happy to send you over that, that Inter Interesting. Paper. Minister, I want to get back to you. Um, sorry to put you on the spot. This particular transaction that you're looking at it, what, what, what time frame do you have? Do you have time frame on your side or it's going to drag along for as long as possible? Do you, I, I think for me, that raises the issue of the political will, the agency, uh, in terms of ensuring that you get rid of uh, whatever blockages that you have and we implement the project. You're right. The, 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 there is a sense of urgency because we are in a, in a squeeze. We are in a similar situation like the rest of us in the SADC power pool. There is a deficit in the short term. In the longer term, that will stable out and we will, we will have enough generation power to, to satisfy our needs. So the, the political will to reach um, self-sufficiency in the total pool is there. The question is, and mind you, you are talking to the Minister of Finance, huh? is, yes, sir. is that, that urgency will be satisfied but not at any cost. Hmm. And I think I'm very happy to hear that there are best practices, and by the way, it is that balance, that sheet that we used together okay. with the World Bank to negotiate with, with these power purchase um, mm. agreement partners. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, I, I know you have issues that you want to comment on, yeah. but before you get on there, I want to ask you about the importance of regional cooperation. Because one would have thought that clearly with this huge deficit, and the realization that we need to come together, these numbers are huge. What's stopping us from actually deepening regional cooperation as far as uh, power generation and, and supply is concerned? I think the, um, the issue of uh, regional cooperation is very important because the location of primary energy sources and demand uh, is not always in the same place. So. Uh, Mozambique has got huge gas, reser gas reserves. They don't necessarily have the demand that matches or justifies, justifies the construction of large power stations. That demand would probably be in the South Southern African power pool or, or beyond. So, and, and in deciding where you locate your power station, there are a number of factors that you take into account. You either locate it closest to the primary energy source and then you transport power through the wires. There's obviously losses in the grid, et cetera. Or you locate it closer to the demand that uh, from a country perspective, I spoke about um, national security, where you want to have that within your borders. Mm. So for, for you to be confident that you will have a plant in Mozambique that you depend on, and, and there is historical precedence to this, uh, Kavora Basa, et cetera, when Mozambique was unstable politically, supplying South Africa had implications. So, so that collaboration and stability within the region is important for regional cooperation. Added to that, there's a need for standardization so that everyone is able to feed into a similar grid with particular standards and a, an efficient functioning market that enables payment and also how you control the grid, because it's very important from a technical perspective to control the stability of the grid. Sadly, and, and um, Linda mentioned to me that from a solar perspective, there's a storage technology that's coming through. But sadly, when you generate power, typically you can't store it. And you need to be able to uh, hive it off to somewhere else, and you, you need to manage a stable grid. And, and my experience within the Southern Africa Power Pool from its early inception in my uh, uh, power generation days was really designed to do that and to control it between the different countries. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of regional cooperation. Fantastic. Mr. Nguvane, I'm, I'm going to come to you in terms of the, the, the issue that has been raised by the minister, which we're dealing with within South Africa, which is price, not at any cost, he says. The quandary of, uh, you know, not uh, building plants, uh, you know, at the end of the day you have uh, expensive power and not having power because you have not planned properly or you, are not, you haven't priced uh, the power properly and at the end of the day you actually don't have power. It's a very difficult situation to sit on. Are you comfortable with the pricing uh, uh, a place where you're sitting it right now? Well. We brought in huge smelters, you know, iron ore, steel industries, aluminium smelters, because we are the cheapest 
price for electricity for a very long time. That was our comparative advantage as a country. But quite clearly, with the, our plants aging, we cannot keep up the, that rate of excellence. We, we have spoken about an increase in the tariff to make it a cost-reflective tariff. But we know that it's politically not really doable. You know, we, so we have engaged in a, what we call a business productivity program and we have saved uh, 70 billion rand uh, in the last in the past uh, six months. So with the efficiencies, you can actually have, you know, probably delay the cost, the rise in tariffs, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of being able to control wastage, and technology can do that. Digital technology can do that. We, in fact, will be cooperating with the WEF on this type of information and access to such technologies. So there's a lot that can be done mm. to put, put back the inflation in the energy sector. But ultimately, of course, we have to build new power stations. Right. Yeah. T Tommy, in t sorry, you want to yeah, come in, yeah? Sure. I, could just, um, <clears throat> I think on this issue of tariffs and high costs, what I find sometimes is that we usually don't look at total life cycle implications always very focused usually on the front end. And I'll give you just two issues uh, as examples. For example, in Nigeria, uh, the vast majority of people then who don't get access to the electricity then go into private generation, where they spend five to six times more to generate their own electricity. Mm. Whereas if you had been willing to pay higher tariffs, you will get the electricity much more cheaper and I think when you look downstream in the implications of what power can bring to a country, to people, in terms of jobs, industries, and all of that, frankly, a lot of time being wasted on the front end in terms of trying to get down to the last dollar, I think is not as uh, valuable. Uh, so that's one thing I would say on that. But secondly, on the regional cooperation question... So do you think that the politicians are overplaying the price-sensitive issue? I th it sounds to me like we don't recognize the crisis, you know, because if the crisis is well recognized, I think it's not the time to try to be looking for, you know, will the investor make money or not make too much money. We, we, we spend so much time on, is he making 50%, 60%? That's the least of the problem, because people are going to pay five, six times more if you don't solve that problem. You're missing out on industries, you're missing out on jobs, you're missing out on so many things in the equation. And so I think, you know, it's back to the political will question again, you know, so very focused on what I think is not where the bigger issues really, really are. Mm -hmm. I was also going to comment on the regional cooperation yes. with the example in, in West Africa, of course, where uh, there's the West African gas project between Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, and uh, Benin. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone is from Ghana, Togo, and Benin, uh, but it hasn't worked well. Because while the pipeline has been built, I think it goes back to the question that, uh, the comment I think uh, Innocent made earlier. Ghana, Togo, Benin relying on Nigeria. Uh, what you find most times is Nigeria will first sort out its own problems before the world uh, meets those commitments, and which means that in the last few years, only half of what has been committed has been met. Mm. And this is one of the big challenges I think we have in regional cooperation is that the primary suppliers will need to, again, have the political will to honor their commitments, irrespective of you know, the implication. Because if you don't do that, then regional cooperation in itself will stand very little chance of working. Mm. Mr. Gouverneur, let me bring you back again into the issue, issue of uh, regional cooperation. You spoke about the uh, Southern Africa power pool. Um, the, the, what is it that we require to get to a point where the Southern uh, African power pool works to uh, you know, uh, efficiently meet the, the, the expectations of the region? Well, we, I've said using centers of excellence like ESCO for the region, you know, bringing in young people to our training centers will greatly facilitate the development of electricity you know, production in our neighboring countries mm. because we have the expertise. The expertise is, 
can be extended given enough participation, for instance, by DFIs. That's one thing. But also, of course, being part of the program of integration within SADC, you know, so far we have concentrated more on trade than on energy. You know, lifting this up to a new level will facilitate this. And, and as I mentioned, Grand Inga offers a new opportunity. Mamabulo would have done the same thing in Botswana if it had progressed. I'm hoping that we can progress that because then it will add a huge amount of energy for the region. Tell me about Inga. We've been talking about it now uh, yeah. since before I was born. Um, <laughs> um, wh where are we with that? Are you hopeful that uh, during our lifetime this thing is going to happen? <laughs> well, I was talking to Mr. Gordon Brown, the former Prime British Minister, Prime Minister. Yeah. He's very much involved in that project right. with the WEF. Very keen to go. And I think it's going to be realizable, not just in our lifetime, but very soon. OK, that's good to hear. Um, uh, at this moment, I would love to take, entertain questions from around the room. Yes, there's a, there's a hand um, at the back there. Again, introduce yourself and be as succinct as possible, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Wadi Ahimi. Um, I work with a company, Sahara Group, in Nigeria. Um, I hear a lot of the things you say in terms of power generation, power generation. But what I don't seem to hear is what exactly are we looking at in terms of the full value chain? Because we continue to generate power, and the people who are really going to pay for this power at the end of the day are the end users. So I can't hear anything in terms of what um, investments are we putting into distribution, transmission, to ensure that all that we're building in terms of generation, whether you have the gas, you have the thermal power, is actually going to be paid for at the end of the day. Thank you very much for that question. Linda, you want to deal with that? So you're shaking your hand in agreement? Yes, and I have to tread carefully because Eskom is on this panel. Um, one of the challenges we... You have my protection, <laughs> you'll be okay. Uh, one of the challenges as a developer we face, um, it, like you rightfully said, is you produce power and it's about getting it onto the grid. So because there's been an underdevelopment of the grid infrastructure across Africa, and South Africa is not immune to that, um, we have all these power generators, and there's an issue sometimes in connecting them. ESCOM has done uh, well. However, I think they also do admit, having engaged with the grid access units, that there is an upgrade that is urgently required in order to facilitate all of the electricity that's going to be produced, one from renewables, coal, um, and, and gas. So to give an example, um, one of the challenges we faced with our project is uh, you get a cost estimate letter at X, so you put in a bid and you come in low in your tariff, etc. Post bid, we get a budget quote that's two times or three times that cost because it has, the infrastructure uh, or the grid infrastructure hasn't been accounted for, and there's also a delay in how we could, when we connect, which obviously affects our EPC and uh, uh, pricing, which can't hold uh, longer than that, and our construction. So. Grid infrastructure is a huge issue across. I know Nigeria faces the same uh, problem. I think, I, I'm not sure, it's, I know it's billions of dollars that are required for your grid infrastructure. So it's a continental uh, 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 problem that also requires the private sector to play. I don't think we can rest everything on um, you know, a, a state-owned entities um, the doorstep. I, I think this is a place where it would be nice to get ESCOM collaborating as well with the private sector in assisting with those challenges. The, the, let me bring you in here, Innocent, uh, because the, the political will issue c keeps coming up. But this, there does seem to be space for the private sector to come in. In your view, what is required for us to get there to ensure that the private sector, both a generation and transmission, uh, plays a role that is, at the end of the day, profitable, but also commensurate with the social needs of, uh, of any society? So on, on that subject, um, I recall the Minister of Finance uh, asked a question as to why we think in terms of utilities, in terms of building out this infrastructure. And to the point uh, of the last question, uh, the issue of uh, transmission and uh, distribution is an integral part of the infrastructure we're talking about. It's part of the $55 billion mm -hmm. that you spoke about. So that's, that's, we're not necessarily ignoring that. The, if, if you look at, um, I'm not saying they necessarily 
the best example to follow, and we will not follow them. We'll probably leapfrog some of the developments. The privatization of the electricity industry uh, in Europe, uh, in the UK, in the late 80s was on the back of massive investment by utilities to build the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the private sector got involved when the infrastructure was already built. If they had come in at the beginning, they might not have invested in some of the infrastructure that is marginal in terms of its return and in terms of its, um, mm -hmm. its functioning. Mm -hmm. So if in, in South Africa where probably uh, the infrastructure has been invested by the state for a long time, and it's in place, you can talk about allowing access to the private sector and, and building them out. In areas where you do not have the base uh, uh, availability, private sector will come in and will invest in areas where they have a good return. And a lot of those are not necessarily delivering the, the development that's required. And, and it's, it's a bit of an ideological statement but that's, uh, that's the reality. Mm. So it, it has to be, the, the solution has to be maybe a collaboration, a public-private partnership, mm. where the state's objectives are also taken into account in the design and construction of some of these projects. Okay, fantastic. You want, you want to come in there? I just one quick comment on the question that was asked. Um, I think we must not forget about the opportunities for distributed power um, across the continent. Yes, for strengthening the grid, but frankly, uh, off-grid, distributed power, mini-grids have now become an investable asset. Um, they've now, in many cases, proven their commercial viability. And so I think we've shifted, they, they can shift from the donor-funded uh, focus that they've had in the past to, to being genuine you know, commercial prospects and ones that are going to be critical to reaching some rural populations throughout the continent. So I think any conversation that addresses that question and the social good question that you're talking about needs to take into consideration mm. Um, everything from solar home systems all the way up to to many many grids. Mm. Well, what's you what's you still understand? You know the minister's view about uh, greedy investors. Sorry, what was the question? Greedy investors. Uh, yes, I've met some. You've met some. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you you want to come in somewhere? Well, I was going to say, you know, let us take steps in a normal milestone development you see in a child. Yeah. Right. At the moment, let's focus on the independent power producers and the renewables, because that's where the biggest contribution is going to come from. We have got vast kilometers and miles of infrastructure in terms of transmission in South right. Africa. A lot of it needs to be renewed. So it essentially built into that is market failure. To expect the private sector to come and fund that, I don't think it's going to be winnable. Mm. OK. There, there's a hand in the back there. Thank you, Mr. Ngoani, for that. Yes, ma'am? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Lourdes Fernandes from Angola. And my question is really related with this PPP. So we have here the Overseas Private Investment Corporation from from United States. And uh, I believe that if the government is having problems, even if the government wants to have the responsibility to, to do the infrastructure, as Mr. Dutri emphasized, I think has opportunity for the private. Because the point is we have to resolve this problem. It's, it's a long time that we are really tired to, to hear Inga and the, all other projects and nothing is working. So I would like to, to put the specific question to the OPIC. What the private sector, I know in African investors that are willing to do invest investment on Thank powering you energy, much. what should they do? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that question. Um, Elizabeth, you want to come in? Uh, um, as I indicated before, everything that, that OPEC and our sister development agencies, development finance institutions do, every single thing we do is with the private sector. So the, you know, the, the billion and a half dollars or billion, 1.2 billion of renewable energy financing in Africa last year is all being done with the private sector. So, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, this is a challenge that we, we, we need to bring public and private together. Uh, but I think that, we, I think we've crossed that bridge and there's a lot of investor demand. And I think it's a matter of creating uh, the right welcome mat um, and the right enabling environment and, and, and bringing those, those two together. The capital is definitely there. 
uh, and growing. But if you think about it right now, only 1% of United States foreign direct investment comes to Africa, 1%. So you know that, that needs to double and triple, but it can only be done so if Africa continues the tremendous positive work it's done on, on, on creating a friendly investment climate here. Elizabeth, what's your pipeline like, without uh, betraying any confidentialities? Uh, what's your pipeline like, and uh, where do you see the demand coming from within within the continent in terms of regions? So r right now, our um, our pipeline is for probably another billion and a half uh, for 2015. Um, increasingly, uh, on uh, we're doing a lot more in gas than we used to be doing. I keep looking at you when when uh, when I mention the word gas. But it's pretty evenly spread uh, across uh, geothermal, solar, wind, probably a little bit more in wind than before, and, and the gas sector. Um, we're doing more in West Africa than we were before, although US int investor interest in West Africa has been s slower for both linguistic and, and historical reasons. Mm. But um, yeah, so it's a very healthy pipeline. And I have to say, um, again, I mentioned the pre President Obama's Power Africa Initiative, which you know, brings, made it, it involved a $7 billion commitment of U.S. government agencies to finance um, power across the continent and doubling access, if we could. I think we will easily achieve the commitments um, that were made because it actually has stimulated new investor interest. Um, we've seen, as a result of the high profile of this Power Africa announcements, we've seen developers coming to the table that weren't even thinking about Africa uh, you know, a year or so ago, and they're now looking at, at investments across the continent. So I think the investor demand uh, is there and coming. It just needs to be uh, structured in a way that works Fantastic. to the best. Um, I'm going to call for the last round of questions um, from the floor. Um, anybody with a question? Minister, you have a question? If you could make it brief. I'm being, uh, somebody's looking at me with a red eye um, at the end there. Time is running out, so quickly, please. Yeah, sure. I just want to go back to the um, question of whether there should be private sector involvement in power generation and um, how we should structure that. And I just want to come back to, to the panelists who said um, it's possibly not possible because of the, the low returns that conventional power generation has, has shown it has. My take is that technology has changed. And with that technological change, the landscape and the possibilities of private sector involvement is not anymore quite comparable to the 90s when the European utilities were, were privatized or outsourced. And I think there, there are good possibilities where there are PPPs possible and where even individuals can put their little solar plant on the roof and feed into the grid. By the way, with a price increase of 20% year in, year out, that's a good investment. Mm. Mm. And we, we, we should not be blinded by a history that has a different landscape. Rather, be innovative and see how we can leverage technology and how we can pool resources from the private and the public sector to <coughs> bridge the real gap, and that is mm. the power generation mm. or the, the lack okay. of power. A quick response from you, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to give, share with us your final thoughts on this um, as, yeah. as um, <clears throat> innocent. Minister, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly aware of the technological developments, but if I go back to my definition of baseload and, and picking, uh, picking capacity, we, should, we cannot run away from the fact that in, in outside of South Africa, where there hasn't been sufficient investment in baseload infrastructure, the traditional capacity sources of baseload still remain. If you look at the cost of uh, solar energy and the conversion rate, which are improving, by the way, uh, less than 20 years ago, they were probably 2%. They're sitting at like 15 or 16%. It's very difficult to scale them up into the kind of uh, quantities that are required to power industrialization. Yes, at an individual level, you can self-generate. I do self-generate it uh, at my own house, but there are certain things like driving industries and street lights are not working. I expect the utilities to be delivering that, mm. and we cannot run away from that. Fantastic. Um, Mr. Ngovane, starting with you, your, your summing thoughts? Well, in terms of regional cooperation, a lot of work is going on right now within SADAC. What we need to do is to extend it into the AU uh, 
conferences, heads of state conferences, but within the region, we are really moving forward. Renewables good for picking, but the state still has a responsibility for baseload. Fantastic. Taps? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the situation is a crisis, as I think uh, was said at the beginning. I don't think, uh, both from the political and the business side, that uh, has been uh, reflected as such. Uh, and I think um, we clearly need to indeed understand all the opportunities that we have in Africa. I think when you look across, there's just so much opportunity in renewable, in gas, in, you know, so much opportunities. Mm. And I think we're just letting our people down. Fantastic. Linda, your last words? The, the private sector wants to invest. And also, I want to say, in terms of regional integration, we'd like to also get involved a lot more. It's, right now, SAP has been utility to utility. We want to get more IPPs involved in that process as well. I think we have a role to play in solving this crisis. OK, Elizabeth, your final thoughts? Uh, yes, I, I met someone who runs a mine in northern Malawi that gets his power by trucking 23 trucks a day from Dar es Salaam. Uh, 300 kilometers to his mine. The mine is no longer viable as a result of that. So I think when we talk about the price of power, we need to remember that when the alternative is sometimes diesel fuel being flown in on prop planes or trucks, it can be as high as $30 a kilowatt hour. So I think looking ahead, we need to realize that technology costs and everything else have driven prices down so low that we need every possible solution. It's, an er it's a crisis. We need renewables, we need gas, we need public, we need private, because the alternatives are great. Uh, and if Africa's enormous growth story is really going to be inclusive and lift up the lives of Africans across the continent, we need every possible power source to be brought to bear. Fantastic. Innocent, your closing remarks? I think um, a number of points. Greater cross-country collaboration is important when we match uh, primary energy sources and, and demand. We need to enable that. We need to standardize uh, the grid and, and the wires to make sure that there's interconnectivity. Tariff regimes, uh, I, I know Dr. Ngubane spoke about us being um, a low cost producer. I think the, the tariff must uh, include a reasonable return for the investors, uh, capital expenditure for the future, and operating expenses. And I think it's, it's an argument that at some point we might not have put aside enough for future development. And therefore, the graph that you'd follow in terms of increases would be less steep than we're faced with now. A policy framework that would enable IPPs to feed into the grid. And um, in the short term, and if you're focusing on industrialization, temporary power might be the solution. And there are some companies, without plugging them, like Agreco, et cetera, mm. who've made uh, a virtue out of supplying temporary power, but it must be seen as temporary power. Sadly, some African countries are now looking at temporary power as, as permanent power. Permanent power. Yeah. Fantastic. Let me thank the panelists. I'm, I must say, though, that uh, what I find, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about Africa. I'm optimistic about the continent. Uh, I do worry about uh, our power deficit. And uh, listening to all of us talk, I, I do get the sense sometimes that the, the agency isn't there. And here is what I worry about. The choices of saying, uh, you know, going back to the minister's uh, uh, comments, you know, power at, at, at any cost. Should we not get to a point where power is available and the price of the power is a way of disciplining us to use our resources in a much better and efficient way? Cheap power uh, encourages us to be wasteful, and that is quite what is currently happening. But I think for me, the bottom line is the sense of agency that I don't see. I travel across the continent. You're right, uh, Dr. Ngubane. It's, uh, thank you for, for making sure that uh, power was available in Cape Town. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a, an irritating thing, but one that reminds us all the time uh, that there's something wrong with our continent, but that there are so many opportunities. If only we could have a sense of agency around ensuring that we've got power to create jobs, economies to grow. And I think at the end of the day, uh, to ensure that the political issues that we are scared of don't come and visit us. Because when people have jobs, because there is power, uh, the rise that we're scared of because power is expensive is not going to happen. But anyway, I could go on and on about this thing. I love this continent. If only we could fix the power. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>